Okay. So we are still, oh, we basically have now done the low mass bars. Up. No, hopefully that works now. No, there's still something to be done. Sorry. So we have done basically low mass stars, and but we still came back up to maybe iron nickel. These mass reached, if at all, to be produced. But means everything that's heavier must be in a heavier star produced. So fusion doesn't work anymore. We need other processes. So again, looking back in the landscape, here you see this Kepler supernova. Ooh, 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 ooh. Type one nova, wrong side. <laughs> Should be a different one. So this Cassiopeia A would be do better. Okay. But we have also seen once this Chandra Seca mass is reached in a non-burning core. There might be neutrons produced. Because the electrons now seek refuge. This is what means neutrons seems to be mechanism we can create again neutrons. And then what we see in the nuclear landscape, it's hard to, to capture protons, especially when you go to heavier elements, because then this cooler wall becomes so high. Climbing over is no option because you don't have enough energy and tunneling through becomes less and less likely because if it increases, obviously all the, also the, 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 the wall becomes thicker and then this tunnel probability goes down exponentially. Mm. Okay. So neutrons seems to be the, the good thing because they're electrically neutral. They don't care about this color wall. capturing somehow neutrons. What happens, of course, in the nuclear landscape, you come to one that is more on the right side. And if you're coming to, to one that is on the very right side, it's radioactive. And then it might say, OK, I have now too many neutrons. I would like to have more and more proton, but one ne less neutron. So one neutron changes its character to become a proton as it happens for the free neutron. This is the so-called radioactive beta minus decay. Okay. So, so obviously, we want to go beyond iron and nickel. We have these problems, cooler wall too high, that energy output is negative. <laughs> we need to invest energy. So neutrons. Neutrons seem to be good because with neutrons, we still get binding in a cheaper nucleon out, which is six, seven mega electron volts per reaction, at least for the ones nearby the value of stability. If we go out, there is somewhere we don't get any net energy, and then this process doesn't happen anymore. And now we have two options. One is this low neutron capture process where we go along this valley of stability. This would be here shown. So we have here the stable nuclear in black and the radioactive ones, which have here too many neutrons in blue. And if we have now neutrons from some source, mystical source, so neutron might hit this 56 iron core uh, nucleus and then it gets captured. What you see here is the elemental abundancy or the isotopic abundancy in the chemical element iron. So 92% or 56 iron and so this year 2% and 0 0.3 and then there is a bit the left side, I think. Okay, so basically we get neutron captured, we have the next value. Nucleus. Next neutron is captured. Okay. Then a neutron is captured, and then we come to a radioactive nucleus, which is here then 59 iron. And if within the next 44.5 days, 
there was not another neutron coming along. If this happens, 50% of this nuclei will decay and become cobalt. If it's in the next 44 and a half days, no neutron comes along, three quarters will have decayed. If a, a neutron comes along and is captured, we come to 60. Iron, which has a half-life of a couple of million years. Oh, plenty of chance to capture another neutron and to come to 61, uh, 61 iron and decay down here, which has only a half-life of six minutes. So it will be going quickly. Oh. Then, of course, once here, we can capture another neutron, come to cobalt 60. And now I wonder why 44 and a half days are giving us red rays to this branching point as branch, branching point, but five and a half years don't, or 5.27 years don't, don't. Another neutron could be captured and become here. Or we can, of course, be dedicated to 16. So you see how we basically get stepwise here along. And this is called the, the slow neutron capture process, but the neutron flux is so low that the nucleus has a time to think, oh, I have now too many neutrons. I'm radioactive. I want to decay and become the next chemical element. We go there slowly but surely along. And then we have occasionally these branching points. If you sit in one of these committees to acknowledge beam time or reject it, you usually get an experiment proposed. And one of these motivations is always this nuclear structure leads to blah, blah, branching point. And, oh, and then you ask yourself how many of the very most important branching points can there be? Usually you would say there's one that is the most important and the other. But each of them is, of course, the absolute most important that explains the universe. Okay, so enough of complaining. Hopefully you got the principle. So we slowly but surely go along this value of stability. And this is then responsible for a good amount of chemical isotope or chemical elements beyond iron, but not all. At latest with uranium, we have a problem because we see here is lead 208, which is the last stable. Wismut 209 is uh, quasi stable. It's so long lived. It. It's radioactive, but it's so long lived as so It's longer lived than the, the lifetime of the universe. Okay. So if you create a, a big amount, a few of them then have decayed since the universe exists. Okay, and the same is a bit true for these ones here. They have a couple of million years of half-life, uranium and thorium. And now somehow they need to be produced. We cannot do this via the slow neutron capture process because everything in between is radioactive. That will decay and go goes back, decays back to, to iron. Uh, nonsense, lead. Oh, okay. So it's of course at the moment, what we see this is one process, but not the entire process. So 50% of the stuff that is heavier than iron is usually being produced with this low neutron. It's just a question, we have now this low neutron. Where do these neutrons come from? If it's again something with this degeneration pressure, one electron gone, the other one say, okay, we, we stop working. We immediately also go. It has this chain reaction. We need another reaction to create three neutrons. And one of the, or the two best candidates are carbon-13, produced in the CNO cycle, Alpha M creates a 16 oxygen. 16 oxygen is one of these spikes. Here, 16 oxygen. So super bound. Once bound, it's hard to, to get rid of. So this creates us then a free neutron. 
Also very important is 22 neon, so already in, in heavier stars then, we need a couple of solar masses. So all of a sudden this, this, this slow neutron capture process does not really go on. Here we need a couple of, of solar masses. We are talking now about the fate of heavier stars. There we can also do this alpha N reaction to 25 magnesium. And here you see basically the yield, the, the amount of stuff that is produced at a given energy of the incident particle of this alpha particle that is incident on this 22 neo nucleus. So one change, one measures there for a while and then goes on for the next energy, lower and lower and lower. And what do you see? This yield, this is a logarithmic scale. So this is some exponential. This is basically what you have seen almost very at the beginning. This is the tunnel probability. And then you see the spikes on top. The spikes is again where the compound system, 26 magnesium, has an excited state. It's unbound in the neutron because then the neutron can say farewell. Yet there basically this compound system has an excited state and we get this resonant enhancement like in this coil state. So then we see it reduces the alpha energy. Of course, the tunnel probability goes down. One has to measure longer. And suddenly, they say become no measured points. This just become upper limits. There's an arrow below indicating it must be somewhere below. We see we have here some resonance. Again, this, is excited, or this compound system has an excited state. But most of the time, we just can give here. Uh, upper limits. And this data is by Michael Jaeger, old group by Wolfgang Hammer, who did basically best job for carbon 12 alpha gamma, the bottleneck reaction, and this one that produces, uh, uh, well, it's one of the major, two major neutron sources in, in heavy stars for this S process. And that's, of course, interesting. The problem is that the star works is somewhere down here. And we measure up here. This is like when you stand and look on the ground and try to, to see how dirty it is. You see the big stuff, but the small dust strains. Mm -hmm. This is an extrapolating. And it's a lot of uncertainty inherent. The problem is these measured points, what you see is occasionally these are weeks. Of, oh, the entire measurement down by Michael, this was a couple of this was about half a year of accelerator time with different energies, but then oh, coming to, to the lower and lower energies, more and more time. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, this was uh, this was overgrown, but with an accelerator which has extreme high currents, that means extreme high beam, a wallless gas target, so no target degradation, uh, best conditions, and you see it, uh, still problems. At the moment, what is going on is, uh, I think this has been remeasured recently at the lunar collaboration in the Grand Sasso Massif in Italy. But they do these measurements, but it's not likely by the other experiments because here we produce free neutrons, free neutrons decay, free neutrons decay via creating antineutrinos, and they might cause problems for the other experiments. You don't want to have a source nearby, which contaminates your own experiment. So there's always a trade-off and fight. So we have this reaction that produces us basically these free neutrons. And therefore, well, 
we can now explain where these peaks have come from. These are the so-called S process peaks. Well, what is happening if we go back to my playground? You see here these red lines at 50, 82, and then it's 126. It's mostly for us interesting here in all this neutron stuff. These are so-called magic numbers. These are the noble gas-like configuration of nuclei. What does a new what does chemically do a, a noble gas? What makes it characteristic? It doesn't want to react. These very special combinations of Neut or special neutron numbers, we have similar. These nuclei do not want to react. That means the reaction rates drop drastically. That means they do not want to capture neutrons. <clears throat> means we produce basically these nuclei, 82, or yeah, 82, but they do not want to capture another new neutron. And the other stuff on the left side does, this is basically like a very narrow doorway or something uh, in the pathway. Or you're on the motorway, the right lane, there's a truck. On the left lane is a truck, they're driving slower. Now everybody has to squeeze through this narrow doorway. That means you get the congestion behind. If you would stop now and look at which part of the motorway there is a congestion where, is, where there are more cars than somewhere else, you would get it at this, this basically a uh, oh, bottleneck. So, and what do we see? This here is just at the nuclei. What do we have there? There's barium 136. Serum 138. So these are relatively abandoned in comparison to other stuff. And then above, well, once you create this or go one beyond, this is like when you pass basically the, 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 the two trucks <laughs> because there is nobody in front of you who can speed on. It is the same is happening then with this S process. It speeds on. But here at this bottleneck, of course, you get this enrichment. And once the neutron flux starts out for any strange reason, you have this stuff created, quite abundant. This happens here. And this happens here at 126, where you end up with lead 208, which is very abundant. Of course, there's also the reason that everything that has been created above is usually decaying back towards this uh, iron, uh, towards lead. So we can basically, now with these neutron sources, uh, nicely explain the, the or loads of these uh, 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 S-process elements. But sometimes we have ten stuff like here, 70 sink, which cannot be reached because here the lifetime is much too short. It immediately decays. Hmm. Now the neutron capture is so unlikely, we cannot explain why the 70 sink is there. And on the other side, we have here 58 nickel, which is most abundant nickel isotope that is around. This cannot be reached by this S process because it's shielded by the stable bits. Oh, there are a couple of things. This here requires proton captures, or like we have in this type 1A supernova, for example, or in the core collapse of what is later to, to, to be to follow. So, Okay, so basically, you see now how this stuff works, more or less. Sometimes, what is quite interesting here would be now a stable isotope of this. Uh, what is this? 70 volume. 
I would have to check what neutral number is this, but here, fortunately, the, the instable nucleus is a beta plus emitter. It changes a proton, so we get one proton less into a neutron and turn it here right. And we bridge this basically, this gap via this kind of stuff. So we can continue. But obviously, there must be also other processes that are important. Okay. Well, and what you see now again, this, this magic numbers play a role. But what I just introduced is 50, 82, 126. That's not the reason that I know these numbers by heart. This is what we nu nuclear guys call magic numbers. When the nuclei that have this type of neutron number do not want to capture any neutrons anymore. Because they say we are saturated. We do not want to react like a noble gas. And this leads then to the enrichment when going along the value of stability of these isotopes. So here again, the lead stuff. But obviously, we also see there is something below, which might be originating again from these neutron numbers and then decaying back via radioactive decay. But at the moment, we can say that about 50% of the heavier material heavier than iron has been created by this S process. If you have well, if you have more questions about the S process, I would say just drop Franz Kepler. Franz is a very nice guy. He would answer every question that you have. So if you do any work in this direction, have questions, need some answer, just drop Franz in a, an email. He's one of the nicest guys that you never meet. And this is very, very true for the very, very good guys. They don't have to prove anybody any, anything anymore. So they are very nice usually. And Franz is certainly top end. Okay, so if you have any questions left towards S process, scenarios around, or oh, he's Mr. S process. Okay. So we have now the S process, and then you see here the second pass. This is what we call the R process. For the R process, we obviously need neutrons, so many neutrons that when the neutron is captured, the nucleus and the nucleus becomes radioactive and starts thinking, oh, I'm no radioactive. I would like to do radioactive decay and change a neutron to become a proton. Before it's just that the uh, just oh and no radioactive, there was another neutron captured. You create another nucleus, which then starts, oh, I have now two neutrons too much. I would like to change one to become a to become a proton and whoosh, next neutron is there. So we need a scenario where very quickly neutrons come along. But this is now type two supernovas. Scenarios of a very heavy star or a heavy star, 15 to 30 solar masses plus up to about 130 solar masses and above there cannot be a star because it's, one gets a direct gravitational collapse to a black hole, but if they have such a, a massive star, what it will do, it will create, it will burn all this, go through all this burning stage, and then we have this iron core left. Iron is not burning anymore. It's just there, it's hot, but not really contributing. But iron is, of course, a heavy stuff, so it starts now to do gravitational pulls, become harder and harder, it becomes denser, 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 and, and, and gravity increases, and you produce more of this stuff. 
then who works against the collapse? Of course, poor electrons. And at some point, it might collapse. And then what happens? The star explodes. So what might happen if you, next summer, or very likely more in the summer, or summertime, evening, or even Scotland rather night, you're outside, and then you look towards Orion, and then you see Betelgeuse, and suddenly Betelgeuse becomes very bright. So 50 solar masses, 500 light years away. We know it by now, this is a, a red supergiant. Oh, so I would stop now this video, and if you want, click on this link, and then you see an artist impression how it very likely will appear when Betelgeuse starts to go off, and then it will be visible for at least a month during brightest daylight. So even in Scotland, hey, bah, where the been again, you you. Look north, and it's at 12 o'clock, and it's still bright. <laughs> Go to bed, wake up at 3 o'clock, have a quick look outside. You still see, or it's still day, almost daylight. That doesn't matter because it will be so bright, even then, you can see it. This is basically what we expect. Maybe in five minutes, maybe in 100,000 years, that Beetlejuice explodes. Enjoy it.